Okay, good afternoon. I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to uh, talk this afternoon about Heritage 2020. Um, as a matter of interest, how many of you have heard of Heritage 2020? How many of you think you've got a good understanding of what Heritage 2020 is all about? Come <laughs> okay, and give this talk. <laughs> um, it's a relatively new initiative. Um, it's an England-only initiative, uh, but hopefully it has some relevance. And I do think it matches very nicely uh, the, the wheel, uh, the spiral that Amanda just showed us in the previous slide. So hopefully it, it speaks to all elements of that uh, in ways that I'll hopefully um, ra rapidly um, rattle through. Um, it's, an, it's a sector initiative that follows on very much in England from the National Heritage Protection Plan. Now, for many people, there was a perception that that was an English heritage plan. Actually, it was a sector plan in itself. Um, and there was an awful lot of um, initial consultation and collaboration um, which went into the, uh, the creation and the initiation of NHPP. There was also, uh, throughout its five-year life, a degree of uh, engagement and involvement from uh, other bodies other than English Heritage. And the reason that I'm giving this talk and why I'm uh, involved in Heritage 2020 is that I chaired, um, over the life of the NHPP, uh, the external advisory board that worked very much with colleagues uh, in English Heritage at that time uh, to uh, oversee the delivery of the plan. Um, but as we came towards the end of uh, the first five years, um, there was a lot of discussion about, well, what happens next? Um, and there had always been an ambition to really try and broaden out from NHPP's initial, uh, initial sort of concepts and the focus specifically just on heritage protection, um, and to try and make sure that it was not just in underpinning terms, but also in very much in perception terms, as a sector-wide initiative that lots of bodies came together and worked on collaboratively. So as we started to approach the end of the NHPP period, this idea of a sort of a new framework, which eventually became called Heritage 2020, <coughs> came into being. Um, the ownership uh, of Heritage 2020 as an initiative uh, is lodged with uh, the Historic Environment Forum, which is a group um, of, of a whole variety of organisations that come together under the chairmanship of John Sell, uh, who represents the National Amenity Societies. Um, the, um, the HEF meets usually three times a year, uh, it oversees the production of the annual Heritage Counts um, uh, publication. Uh, it's involved with advocacy, um, uh, has a series of working groups involved in things like climate change, skills, etc. And so there's now, uh, underneath the HEF, the, the, the forum, there's a new um, subcommittee effectively that, that uh, delivers and takes forward the Heritage 2020 initiative, which I, again, I currently chair. Uh, the HEF, uh, and indeed Heritage 2020 are facilitated and supported by the Heritage Alliance, um, which again is a way of ensuring that, make, that uh, a wide variety of organisations have an input into the process. Um, and as you'll see, uh, as I go through with how Heritage 2020 is going to be taken forward, um, the Heritage Alliance will uh, be the home for uh, a staff support uh, service for the, the new framework. Um, in terms, again, of the, of the cycle and things like evaluation, We've been very fortunate um, to be able to um, build from the NHPP and the, the processes of evaluation and thinking that were built into that. There was a very major uh, consultation, which I'm sure many of you were involved in back in 2014. Um, and uh, I won't go back into the numbers game that we were playing yesterday, but we had over a thousand responses to that consultation. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of good evidence on which we've been able to think about, about how we move forward. Um, a lot of very good work was done um, by a whole variety of individuals uh, representing organisations across the sector, and that uh, emerged in the form of a draft framework document which was published online uh, in the autumn last year. Hopefully many of you have seen that. Um, that was the basis for a, 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 what I think was a relatively modest consultation um, over the winter period, um, but a number of very helpful responses were received from bodies across the sector again in terms of the, the ambitions that were, the, were set out which I'm going to go through in a little bit more detail, specifically in relation to the capacity building aspect of things. But the way that Heritage 2020 is now being taken forward is through a series of working groups. There are five themes, which I'll, I'll show you on the next slide. Um, each theme has a working group, uh, an independent chair, um, something like eight, eight to ten uh, members. Those working groups are just being finalised at the moment. There will be ways in which other people can engage with the process as well. Um, through effectively sort of you know, observer or, or sort of corresponding member status. Uh, this is a very much an attempt to ensure that everybody can feel like they can have a role to play and can chip in thoughts and ideas. And the key initial role of the working groups is to establish the priorities for each of the themes. And the, 
the overarching aim of Heritage 2020, which is really important to establish right from the start, is it's not a strategy, uh, perhaps in the way that we were talking about in yesterday's session, for the whole historic environment. It's not a description of everything that we do in the sector. It's an attempt to show where collaboration uh, can add value to what individual organisations already do themselves. <coughs> So it doesn't feature some aspects, some really important aspects of the historic environment sector. And the example that we tend to use when we talk about this is, for example, it doesn't really talk about designation, uh, which is a function of historic England. Uh, therefore, added value from collaboration uh, is not really feasible. Um, so therefore, that doesn't really feature in Heritage Bank. And you could look at other things in the same way. So when, you, when I talk a little bit more about the capacity building theme, or when you go and look at the other aspects of Heritage 2020, it's important to bear in mind that it only um, features aspects where it's collaboration and added value, and that in itself is, is capacity building, I would suggest. Um, where we're heading at the moment um, is towards a publication uh, later this year in the autumn, um, timed with Heritage Counts. And from now on, every year, there'll be a chapter, a new separate chapter in Heritage Counts, which will effectively summarise the work that's gone on underneath the umbrella of Heritage 2020. There'll also be a separate publication and an evaluation of the work that goes on under, under uh, Heritage 2020 via a website. Uh, that website doesn't exist yet, but that will be the domain name uh, when it's uh, set up <coughs> for the future. Um, and I'm hopeful um, that uh, once uh, we've got the uh, applications and uh, various other things in place, that there'll be some staff support uh, for Heritage 20 because I think whilst it's uh, an attempt to bring the resources of a wide variety of organisations to bear, uh, inevitably it means it's dependent on a number of key individuals who are already very busy um, and therefore to really help drive it forward it's going to need some additional staff support. So look out for that, hopefully there'll be an advertisement to come um, in a way in which anybody who might be interested in, uh, in working with Heritage 2020 to take it forward and get involved. So the five themes um, that were identified um, uh, once we've got this, got our head around the idea that we were broadening out from the initial sort of heritage protection uh, theme under NHPP um, are shown on the screen here, and I won't, I won't read them through. Um, but they do, I think, encompass um, all the different components of the historic environment sector, where again, collaboration is really thought to be uh, valuable and important. Hopefully you can all see the words on the screen uh, because I want to go through um, several things which uh, would be worth you having a look at if you can. Um, I don't want to go through all these in, in any great detail, but basically what we're doing is, in, and those of you that have seen the framework document will see, that it's set out in such a way that's, that describes some of the, um, the key achievements um, over the last decade in each of these theme areas, some of the current challenges, um, and therefore the areas where collaboration and, and action is needed um, and then sets out a vision uh, under each of these themes for where we'd like to be by 2020. Um, and what I'm going to do over in the second part of my time now is just run through the aspects of that for capacity building um, that relates specifically to the theme of this section. So I'm not going to talk any more about the other four themes, but I would encourage you to go and look at the framework document and, uh, and have a look for yourself. So in terms of coming up with uh, some sort of statement as to what, uh, what capacity building is all about in relation to Heritage 2020, this is a, a, effectively a sentence that's taken from the framework document that tries to show that it's about bringing together people with skills and infrastructure, knowledge, data um, to really help us move forward in a whole variety of areas to meet the broad aims that we have right across the historic environment sector in relation to understanding, conserving, explaining, championing. There are effectively three aspects where it's really emphasizing that there's a, a need that's been identified in relation to capacity building. These relate to inevitably to people, human capital. It relates to uh, a broader sense of a movement. Um, some people would argue going back to some of the philosophy that established organizations like the National Trust. Um, and then trying to find ways to get a lot more people involved. One of the key things about capacity building in terms of how we perceive this is it's how we can get more people involved with the right skills to really help us move things forward. We all recognise that our organisations are under considerable pressure. Um, there are not a great deal of resources. We're a relatively small um, discipline. The best way to achieve this is to get more people working together to achieve that collaboration and therefore enable us to meet the targets that we've defined for ourselves. 
In terms of thinking about some of the um, achievements of the last decade in relation to, to capacity building, um, these are the four areas that have been defined. And I should perhaps just make it absolutely clear at this point that the, the, the slides that I'm going to run through in relation to capacity building are pretty much the work of the uh, initial members of the working group that's uh, set up in relation to capacity building. These are not my thoughts. These are very much the thoughts of the people who are engaged in starting to think about capacity building. And the chair of that working group is Mike Brown, um, who's currently the president of IHBC. And the vice chair of the group is Jan Wills, um, who, as you know, is chair of SEFA. Uh, so there's been some early buy-in, effectively, from the two key professional bodies that represent the historic environment sector. There's more work to be done on this, um, and I'm not for one moment saying that this is the sort of the final word. There are some, I'm sure there's more uh, uh, nuancing to be done, uh, a little bit more thinking. Once we bring the working group together with its full membership, the idea is that some of this will evolve. It's not cast in stone for a five-year period. But this is the, this is the initial thoughts that, uh, that are set out principally by Mike and uh, with some, uh, some involvement from Jan as well. Um, so in terms of achievements over the last decade, um, a, a long-term commitment and an understanding that capacity building is important for our sector. That's particularly perhaps in relation, and, and uh, I think in the document you'll see that they couch this very much in terms of thinking about the local, local government planning uh, systems that we need to have in place. Um, better cross-sector working, the fact that we have fora like HEF, uh, I mean, in archaeology, we have groups like the Archaeology Forum, the Archaeology Training Forum, um, the idea that various individual organisations can come together um, and take forward their own agendas. The, the fact that if you look at documents like um, Heritage Counts or the Heritage at Risk Register uh, in England, uh, they show, you may not think this, you may not perceive this, you may not believe this, but those documents show that the condition of heritage is gradually improving. Um, and another key aspect that obviously relates in particular to skills um, is the idea that uh, there have been a, uh, an increase in the opportunities for um, vocational learning, apprenticeships, um, some of the um, HLF-funded workplace learning bursary programs, for example. Those are seen as examples of, of achievements that clearly are things we need to build on um, in the coming, year, coming years, but uh, some aspects that are uh, good to have a good basis on which to move forward from. And in terms of then the, what have been identified as the main priorities for sector collaboration in relation to capacity building, and again, I would stress that you've got the four other themes, um, which I'm not talking about, so you've got other aspects as well. But the four priorities, and, and in a sense, I think probably the key one that's always uh, pulled out and, and uh, is, uh, is a focus for attention in almost any discussion around at this time, um, is thinking about a sustainable model uh, for local planning authority, conservation and archaeology services as the basis of a lot of the capacity building that we do. Um, better support for the independent heritage sector, how we can work together, making sure again we can help that, the independent sector through the Heritage Alliance to build that broad movement of support, get more public engagement with our activities. Focusing on things like education, training, uh, continuing professional development, where um, groups like um, the professional bodies clearly have an absolutely fundamental role to play, but are not alone. We all need to take responsibility for these things. That links in to increasing the uptake of training and uh, qualifications, uh, right across the sector. And interestingly, I think the last point, creating demand, is another absolutely crucial one. And the two groups that are working at the moment within the Historic Environment Forum are looking at skills, uh, which clearly um, meshes into this to some extent. One group is looking at supply, but the other group is looking at demand. And in some ways, this solution to the supply question is to create more demand. Um, and uh, so that's an important part of what's uh, thought to be the case here too. Uh, all I want to do uh, for the last few minutes is just to run through the vision, um, which I think is in some ways the most important part. At the moment, what we don't have are the, the practical steps, if you like. What's the action plan for how we're going to build on those achievements and the sort of things that we've been thinking about so far to try and hit uh, the, uh, the targets, as it were, which are the outcomes that we've determined for in relation to capacity building. So there are five ele elements, five visions uh, components of the vision, if you like, uh, that have been defined in relation to capacity building. The task of the working groups over the next six months is to develop the action plan um, to how to really work together to try and make sure that by 2020 we've achieved this vision. Um, they mesh and, and link straight back to the previous five points on the last slide. So the first one um, relates to this new sustainable model um, for local authority services. Um, linked to um, better and more accessible HERs. 
And I think everybody agrees that's one of the absolutely fundamental um, elements, both for uh, within the archaeological se sector, but also very much for conservation and uh, IHBC members as well. Um, there's good agreement across the piece on that. Uh, the second vision by 2020, better skilled and qualified practitioners, craftspeople, better access to CPD, workplace learning, um, ensuring that employers take some degree of uh, responsibility for this, but obviously there's also an employee responsibility in relation to CPD. Uh, the fact that we want more workplace uh, development, more workforce development, that becomes an everyday, and there's better understanding that that leads to healthy businesses uh, and a thriving sector. This is a, a broad plan, so it's not just about heritage professionals, it's also about groups like owners, developers, making sure that they understand uh, why uh, uh, training for them and having developing their understanding of need uh, is equally important. Making sure that we can all work together with, with the elected members, other decision takers, making, allowing people to be more confident in the judgments that they make um, and uh, the opportunity to be innovative in how we think about things, not just uh, high bound perhaps by uh, previous uh, models of, uh, of delivery. We're all going to have to be a bit more creative in how we work, for, work together uh, in the future, particularly if resources become even more constrained than they are at the moment. Um, fourth part of the vision uh, relates to this idea of a, of a thriving uh, independent heritage sector, um, uh, an effective civil society able to take on action at national and local level. And I think this is going to be a really crucial area, this idea of sort of citizen science uh, that we're starting to see, a whole range of projects, many of them HLF funded, where they're targeting uh, individual uh, members of the public to try and uh, enhance the data, enhance the systems that we have working with us. And there are a whole range of examples like this, in, uh, certainly in archaeology, uh, certainly involved, uh, that the CBA is very um, heavily involved with. This is going to be absolutely crucial. Um, and then the fifth, um, aspect um, relates back to owners um, who are absolutely fundamental to this in terms of their responsibilities for uh, looking after and conserving uh, the historic environment, making sure they have access um, to uh, the, what they need, they understand their responsibilities, they're able to access appropriately skilled contractors where that's appropriate, and they, and they understand and they can, they're able to commission uh, appropriate professional advice. So those are the sort of five visions, if you like, that have been set out in relation to capacity building for Heritage 2020. I think as you see and hear the, um, the rest of the presentations this afternoon, you'll see that they mesh in to my, from what I can tell from looking at the abstracts, to some degree uh, with the different elements of the vision that we've defined here. This is very early days. We're in effect the year zero uh, for, uh, for the Heritage 2020 initiative. Um, there's a little bit more detail needed. The, the real task now is to get the working groups in place to flesh this out. There, there'll be hopefully plenty of opportunity for you all, in both individually and through your organisations, to get involved in some of these initiatives, particularly once the action plans are developed. And also we want to get more organisations buying into these, uh, these uh, actions and the, the vision that we have here. The website, once it's up and running, uh, hopefully once we've got some staff in place to take it forward, uh, will be crucial in terms of the communication. Um, those of you who use Twitter, there's already a Heritage 2020 Twitter account. Um, the main channel for communicating this at the moment is through the Heritage Alliance's update um, e-bulletins. And if any of you don't get that on a fortnightly basis, I'd certainly encourage you to do it, because uh, it's a really useful way of keeping up to date uh, with a lot of information. Uh, and that's primarily at the moment the vehicle that we're using to communicate about Heritage 2020. Um, but if there are any other specific questions, and if you're really desperate to find out anything more, do feel free to email me, and I'll be very happy to try and do what I can. Uh, but I'll, in most cases, what I'll be doing is signposting you towards the working groups. Um, and once the website's up to date, we'll have contact points for each of the working group chairs, um, so that people can contact and, and therefore contribute uh, individually to each of the aspects of what we're trying to do. That's a relatively quick run through. Uh, I just wanted to give you a flavor of what Heritage 2020 is all about how it works in relation to capacity building. Um, and I think it hopefully sets you off quite well at the start of this um, session um, in terms of a, of a broad national program that is about collaboration, because I think that's everybody, every conference you go to at the moment, people are talking about we need to work better together. That's what this is about. It's trying to establish a framework to enable us to, to work better together, to build capacity for a whole variety of purposes linked to the other themes, um, but ultimately, uh, it's in our own hands, and this, will own, this initiative will only succeed 
that all of the organisations in the historic environment sector get involved, uh, and I hope that you'll have an opportunity to do that um, over the next few years. Thank you. Thank you.